Hello friends and family from all around the world. We want to welcome you to a brand new quarter study here on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This quarter, quarter number two, we're going to be diving into a special topic. I love this topic, the great controversy. If you don't understand the great controversy, then it's hard to understand the Bible because every single book, it seems every single chapter of the Bible, it has some type of great controversy theme. So we want to thank you for joining us from week to week here on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I want to go ahead and introduce our panel and then we're going to tell you how you can get a copy of our notes for those of you who might be tuning in new and want a copy of those notes. So to my left, we have Miss Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Ryan. On Monday, I'm excited, first of all, about this quarter, but on Monday we have Lucifer Deceives, Christ Prevails. Amen. All right. Mm -hmm. And to you, to your left, we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Tuesday's lesson, Planet Earth Becomes Evolved. Amen. Praise the Lord. And of course, to your left is, I say, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Perrin, but Professor Daniel Perrin, it's always a blessing to have you, brother. Thank you. And I have Wednesdays, which is a lovely title, Love Finds a Way. All right. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, Pastor John Loma King, all the way at the end of this long table. Yes. And I cap it off with the title, Our High Priest, <laughs> right. how that fits into the great controversy. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Of course, lesson number one is entitled The War Behind All Wars. And uh, before we pray and get right into our lesson, we want to remind all of our viewers that you can actually get a copy of our notes. We all take notes differently. Uh, and that's a blessing, I think, because we all think differently. Our minds work a little differently. But if you want a copy of the panelists' notes from week to week, all you have to do is send us an email. And that email address is ssp at 3 ab org. Again, that's SSP, that stands for Sabbath School Panel, at 3ABN.org. And of course, you can send us a, a message and request a copy of the notes, and we'll make sure we get those to you each and every week from that point on. So anyways, so let's go ahead and have a prayer. There's lots to discuss and little time to do so. So Pastor John Lomaking, why don't you have an opening prayer for us? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, the blessing is always ours. But Lord, we know the task and responsibility for sending your Holy Spirit is yours. We open our hearts and our minds this morning. We ask that you flood our thoughts. We've done our homework, Lord, but our homework always falls short of your glory. Mm -hmm. So give us wisdom this morning as we uh, tackle this lesson and may your people be listening to hear what the Spirit has to say in Christ's name. Amen. Mm. Amen. 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 Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, the 3ABN Sabbath School panel also airs on the radio as well. So each and every week, uh, each lesson we say our name so that those listening on radio will know who we are. My name is Ryan Day and I have Sunday's lesson, which is actually entitled War in Heaven. But I want to start actually with Sabbath afternoon just to kind of give us a wonderful uh, a foundation for what it is we're going to be studying this week. The lesson brings out, it says, if, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? How can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? In this week's lesson, we will explore the age-long conflict between good and evil, beginning with Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. We will examine the origin of evil and God's long-suffering in dealing with the sin problem. God is a God of incredible love. His very nature is love. All of his actions are loving. Love can never be forced, coerced, or legislated. And of course, brings out a, a quote here from The Desire of Ages, page 22, which says, uh, only by love is love awakened. I love that. Only by love is love awakened. To deny the power of choice is to destroy the ability to love. And to destroy the ability to love is to eradicate the possibility of being truly happy. God wins our allegiance by his love. He is dealing with the great, controversy, the great controversy between good and evil in such a way that sin will never arise in the universe again. God's purpose is to demonstrate before the entire universe that he has always acted in the best interest of his creatures. Looking at the world through the lens of God's love in the light of the great controversy between good and evil reassures us, uh, reassures each of us that right will triumph over wrong and will do so forever. I love that. And of course, Sunday's lesson, War in Heaven, it has us asking in the very opening question about the passage that we find in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Uh, it is there that we find the God's churches mentioned and the enemy, Satan, that old 
dragon, the serpent, uh, that old dragon called the serpent and Satan, he's warring against God's people. He's trying to destroy Christ. And uh, we see there in verses 7 through 9. I'm going to read that right now and then we're going to unfold what it is that the, uh, the lesson is asking. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. It says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And, I, and that age old question, how can, can sin begin in such a perfect place as heaven, right? Many people think sin began down here on earth, but actually it began in heaven above. And uh, why did God allow this to prevail? Why did God allow Lucifer to continue on past this rebellion? Surely he could have squashed him like a little mosquito right there, eradicated him and done away with it. And uh, we, we probably would have never had endured this situation, right? Not the case. God had to allow it. And the answer is found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. All of these questions that we heard from Sabbath uh, afternoon's uh, message here, and I'm just going to go back here and see if I can find some of these. You know, how, uh, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? How can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? And of course, Pastor John Loma King would be quick to remind us, are there any good people? <laughs> That's assuming there's good people, right? None of us are good but one, right? That is God. Uh, but when you start asking these tough questions, the answer to that question is God is love. And we start to have to look into the nature of that love to understand why this great controversy battle had to unfold and must unfold the way that it has. Of course, when I jump over into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great love chapter, we're not talking about God is, is love in the sense that He's just mere loving or that He has loving attributes. I think even us as human beings, as twisted and messed up as we are, we can express, uh, have feelings or expressions of love, but yet in God's very nature, in His very essence, of who he is, he is love, not just mere loving, but he is love. We get a glimpse into the nature of that love when we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read verses 4 through 8. It says, love suffers long and is kind. So remember, God is love. You could just insert right there where it says love is, you could just put God there because God suffers long and is kind. Uh, his love does not envy. His love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not be behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And I love the first three words of verse eight, love never fails. I mean, I love that passage because it helps give us a glimpse into God's very character, his very nature. When it says God is love, what does that mean? How can you be love? Uh, that would be like me looking at Jill and saying, well, Jill is a very pretty lady. She is beauty. You know, that doesn't, I mean, that, we, that would be weird to hear someone say that. Like Pastor Rafferty, uh, he's a handsome young man. He is, you know, he is handsomeness. I mean, that's, is that we don't use those type of words to describe each other, but God can be described as love. And of course, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 33, I had to bring this out because it really sums up this point that we're trying to make here. And it starts with, as you guys know, if you've ever read uh, the Conflict of the Ages series, the Conflict series is the, ver or the Patriarchs and Prophets is the very first book. And the very first three words of that book is God is love. I love that. And then at the very last of the Conflict series with the great controversy, what does it say in the very, what's the last three words in that book? God is love. The great controversy is all summed up in these words, but it goes on to say here, his name nature, his law is love. It ever has been, it ever will be the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose ways are everlasting, changeth not. With him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all the intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. And then I love this next line here. It says, God desires, here it is. The gospel can be summed up in the sentence right here. God desires from all his creatures, the service of love. Service that springs from an appreciation of his character. Mm 
He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience. And to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. I love that. And so it's all based on love. That comes from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 33. And so we will learn that true love requires freedom. And that's why God allowed Lucifer to continue on. This war that broke out, it must have an end. It must now play out because of God's, God's love requires freedom. He allows us to exercise our free will. But of course, that freedom involved risk. And of course, the risk that comes of losing those people People to the free will he has invested in them. And of course, that same principle applied to Lucifer. Lucifer and all the other angels were created with free will. That at any point in time, they could choose freely to continue to serve God for all eternity or to rebel. And of course, Lucifer did just that. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. We catch a glimpse into the heart of this rebellion of Lucifer. And I'm going to begin with verse 12, Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. It says, Son of man, take up the lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, and we know this king of Tyre is for sure talking about Satan because of what the very opening words say here. Notice uh, notice continuing in verse 12. It says, Thus says the Lord God, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Here it is, verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. We know the king of Tyre himself wasn't in Eden. This is speaking uh, obviously metaphorical of of, uh, of Lucifer himself. It says, Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Verse 14, You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now, did God create a devil? No. He created a beautiful, perfect angel of light with the free will to choose how he's going to respond to God. And he goes on to say here, he established you, but he says, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. This is indicating that not only was he just, and and, and no disrespect here, but he was no just some ordinary angel or ordinary messenger. He was in the very presence of God, the very throne presence of God. But he goes on to say, you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And then verse 17 here, it says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they might gaze at you. I encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14 as well. It gives us a glimpse into the heart of Lucifer. And by the way, if you go on and read Patriarchs and Prophets, page 39, I I was going to read some portions, but my time has ran out. But if you go read the 39th page of Patriarchs and Prophets, it gives you a glimpse into how God, he suffered long with Lucifer. He bore patience with Lucifer. He worked with Lucifer. He pled with Lucifer to change and he gave him uh, tremendous opportunities to repent, to confess, and he would have reinstated him to his, oh, his same position. But because of Lucifer's pride, he fell. And so God is love. And so why, does, why did he bore along with, uh, with Lucifer? The same reason he does with us, because he is love and love requires freedom. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What an incredible start to this lesson on the great controversy. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at Lucifer deceives Christ prevails. Ryan talked about the origin of sin in a perfect place. I don't think for eternity I'm going to understand how in a perfect world, self-seeking arose, pride, selfishness, Lucifer's desire for self-exaltation. His pride ripened, as it were, into full-on rebellion against his creator. He stirred up rebellion amongst the angels. And I've also wondered, Ryan, how in the world were the angels led into this rebellion? Mm -hmm. Did they not love God? Were they not created by him? How did that happen? For that, we're going to look at the deceptive power of Satan. Mm -hmm. Ryan read this verse. We're going to read it again. Revelation 12, verse 9. We see this deceptive power of Satan. Revelation 12, verse 9. The great dragon was cast out. Who's the dragon? That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Where was he cast out from? He was cast out from heaven. Who, what's that word? Deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and the angels were cast out with him. Now, how many of the angels were deceived and joined in this rebellion and were cast out to the earth? A third. If you look at Revelation 12, verse 4, 
we see his tail. This is the great red dragon's tail or Satan's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. If you look at Revelation 120, we see that stars can equal angels. We won't look that up now, but a third of the angels who were in heaven, who loved God and honored God were deceived by Satan and made a choice to throw their allegiance with the devil instead of with Christ. Mm -hmm. How does Satan deceive? And then we're going to look at how you and I have freedom of choice. But how does Satan deceive? I believe one of the main reasons he deceives is by attributing to God his own character. We're going to talk about that. Some of the ways that Satan attributes to God his own character. This is from Great Controversy, page 498. In his dealing with sin, God could employ only righteousness and truth. Satan could use what God could not, flattery and deceit. Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The discord which his own course had caused in heaven, Satan charged upon the law and government of God. All evil he declared to be the result of the divine administration. Do we not see that today? Mm -hmm. What happens if a tornado comes in and wipes out or a hurricane? What does insurance call it? An act of God. An act of God. Mm -hmm. Is that an act of God? Mm -hmm. Of course it's not. We see how Satan has so twisted our minds and understandings and deceived so many people today, even Christians. So let's look at how he misrepresents the character of God. Lie number one. Now, I'm stepping in maybe a little bit into Pastor James's day because he talks about in the, the sin in the Garden of Eden. So hopefully I don't overstep too much here. But what did Satan tell Eve in the garden? Has God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is that lie that Satan says? He says God's restrictive. Mm -hmm. What is the truth? Sin is restrictive. Sin is addictive. Sin puts you and I in bondage. God is the one who brings freedom. God's law is liberty, but Satan twists our understanding and makes us think, well, if you follow God, you're going to be restricted. Mm. Second Peter 2, verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he's brought into bondage. So Satan promises liberty. And as soon as you and I take that first step into the glittering world of sin, the seemingly glittering world of sin, we start to become ensnared and brought into bondage. What's another deception that Satan says? Remember in the garden, he said, you shall not surely die. So what does he, what's the lie? He says, God's a liar. God is untrustworthy. What is the truth? Satan's a liar. Jesus said that very clearly to the scribes and Pharisees in John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. By contrast, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. What's another lie? What did Satan tell Eve in the garden? God knows when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open. This is speaking of when you eat of the fruit and you will be like God. So what is the lie that Satan tells us even down to today? God's selfish. God only looks out for himself. The truth is Satan's the one who's selfish and God is unselfish. From the cradle to the cross, when Jesus was on this earth, he represented the character of God, the unselfishness of God. I love this quote from Stephen Haskell's book, The Cross and Its Shadow. It says at the cross, the infinite love of Christ and the unbounded selfishness of Satan stood face to face on the cross. This deceptive nature of Satan was fully unmasked. What's another lie that he tells us? And Ryan alluded to this when he asked that question in the beginning. The lie is that God causes pain and suffering. And the lie is also, well, God could stop it and he chooses not to. What's the truth? Satan is the one who brings sin and suffering and pain and death and destruction. What did Jesus come for? Luke 4, verse 18. He's standing there in the synagogue. He quoted from Isaiah. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's one who crouches or cowers, those who are deeply destitute. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, freedom, pardon, forgiveness to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So the choice is ours. In the beginning, the angels in heaven had a choice and one third of them made a choice to choose to buy into Satan's deceptive power and made a choice against God. Adam and Eve had a choice, which Pastor James is gonna to talk to us about. Today, you and I have a choice. Joshua 24, verse 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, what is he saying? Joshua is saying, are you going to follow God because of tradition or upbringing or because of what your parents did? Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? Are you going to follow God because of peer pressure and what those around you are doing? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. You and I need to make a choice. Are we going to follow Satan, the great deceiver? Or are we going to make a choice to follow God? Remember after the golden calf experience, Moses, we're in Exodus 32. Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. I want to be a son of Levi. Mm -hmm. I want to make that choice. Yes, God, I will follow you. Mm -hmm. So in closing, even when we are Christians, sometimes Satan can still come in, can he not? And he can still try to deceive us or twist our thinking. When Satan says, who do you think you are? Speaking for God, you're nothing but a sinner. You can tell him the word of God says, I might have been a sinner, but I am forgiven. I am justified. I am sanctified and washed in Jesus Christ. When Satan says your sins are too great, you cannot be forgiven. You can say the word of God says that God has cast my sins into the depths of the sea. When Satan says there must be sin in this person's life, that's why they're dealing with this trial or this struggle or this difficulty. You can say the word of God says that Satan came to steal, kill and destroy, but Jesus came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. When Satan says God's law is restrictive, are you really sure you want to follow him? You can say, the word of God says that God's law is liberty and Jesus came to set me free. When Satan says, God doesn't want you to be happy. You can say, the word of God says that Jesus wants to fill me with all joy and peace in believing so that we can abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to encourage you, no matter where you are in your journey with Jesus, when Satan comes in with those deceptions against you, you have the opportunity to make a choice. Choose to stand on the word of God. Stand on what God says about you and make a choice for Jesus. Choose to stand on the Lord's side. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill, so much. Appreciate that. All right, my friends, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a moment. So don't go anywhere. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Pastor James Rafferty at this time for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Jill. Powerful lesson, the great controversy theme. Planet Earth Becomes Involved is the lesson we have for Tuesday. The lesson quarterly says, when God created the earth, he created it perfect. The Bible says that he saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very perfect. Good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. There was no stain of sin or evil anywhere. And I love that. I love that picture because 
many times when we think about God creating this earth, we think about it in the context of its present condition. And at times it can overwhelm us because we can think, why did God create this? But God created the world perfect. Perfection would mean that this earth was created by God and not by any process of evolution because the process of evolution requires death and a diminishing of the perfect in place of the imperfect. So we have imperfection coming in with death. Death itself is imperfect. Death falls short of perfection. And again, since sin results in death, death itself had no part in God's original creation, right? Death is in fact an enemy of God. And the Bible tells us that it is the last enemy that God is going to destroy according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26. And I love that beautiful truth. So God created man in his image. And as Ryan was sharing, that is the image of love. God created man in the image of love. God didn't just give mankind freedom. Freedom is a, ne a necessary part of love. And of course, that involves risk, as Ryan again shared so well. But, but being created in his image means that freedom was not some kind of external app downloaded into our internal hard drive to be accessed and, and run with certain programs, certain activities that mankind would participate in. Freedom, liberty, free choice is how our human DNA operates. Liberty is a part of our DNA. If you remove it, humans die. I mean, even, even though we may still breathe, even though we, we may still act like we're alive, we're not alive, we're dead. And the Bible basically says in Genesis that God breathed into us life. He breathed into us his spirit. We became living souls. And the Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. So you can see here this beautiful connection between the image of God, the love of God, and the freedom and the liberty of the spirit that comes into us and forms us in his image. So freedom and liberty is part of the DNA of humankind. And that's why we have this tree. That's why we have this test. That's why we have this risk. That's why we have this opportunity for choice, this opportunity for evil. So in us, in the human race, built into every molecule, Every cell, every fiber, every atom of our being is the spirit or breath of life and with it is the spirit of liberty. We feel it. We sense it. I know as Americans, perhaps we feel even more than, than others do. We just sense that liberty has to be had in all that we do and all that we say and all that we are. It is in our DNA. It is why men, why women, why children are at their very best when they're in a free society. We are birthed in freedom. We are birthed in liberty. We are created in the bosom of freedom and liberty. Spiritual energy, the very breath of God comes into us and it brings with it freedom and liberty. God is love and therefore God is. Where God is, there is liberty. For love necessitates this freedom, this freedom to choose. And this is where we find Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They are in this creation of freedom and this creation of liberty. Yet choice brings this risk and God knew that it would bring risk. In fact, Shelley's not with us on this particular lesson quarter, but she would always remind us of Revelation chapter 13, verse eight, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right. What does that verse mean? It probably means a lot of things, but one of the things it definitely means is that Jesus Christ, that God, that the Godhead knew ahead of time what they were doing when they created us free. Mm -hmm. And knowing ahead of time what they were doing, they had to have a backup plan. Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world was put in place for the very beginning of creation because we were created to be free. That is the very core of our being. The founding fathers of the great nation of America all knew the value of freedom. They understood it as something that was obvious. They understood that it was something that was not given to, not, not parsed out to, but something that was actually part of who we were. And that is why they established this great nation on the document, the great document of the Constitution. They understood that everything that God had created, he had created in his image of love, was created in this 
atmosphere of freedom. Mm -hmm. So it was everything to them because they knew what Adam knew, what Eve knew in that first experience in the garden. They knew as Adam and Eve stepped into the cruel tyranny of sin, they knew what it, what it meant to be under tyranny, to be under control, to be under the bondage of rulers who were not themselves just and loving as God was. And they had broken away from that. They had broken away from the slavery, the dark masters of this world, the forces of evil, evil that capture human beings and, and bring them into bondage. They'd broken away from that and they wanted to, get, to extend this liberty to everyone who would come to this great place, who would recognize these great principles. And so they established this nation, a nation free, a nation free to worship God or not worship God. And that's what made America, a Protestant Christian nation or a Protestant nation, Protestant America, it wasn't that they had a, a religion, they had uh, a belief in the principles of Christianity that allowed freedom for every religion, for every creed. Now, when we look at this in this context, we recognize that this is why Jesus came to this world. He came to this world because mankind stepped in under the tyrant of Satan and sin. He came, as Jill was sharing, uh, Luke chapter 4, he came to set us free. He came to give us the freedom and the liberty from that bondage, from that prison house. The devil came to kill and steal and destroy, but Jesus Christ came as our deliverer to set us free. Free to love, free to live, free to be happy again in his kingdom, uh, his kingdom of grace, which had cl cl uh, clearly been uh, taken from us by the deceiver, the accuser. Fallen mankind worshiping ourselves, worshiping the devil rather than worshiping God in whose image we were created. So Jesus plainly said that, that we were following the devil. You of your father, the devil, John 8, 44, uh, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and he abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks a lie because he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Lies are the main course of the accuser. They're his diet. He uses them to turn us from God, to turn us into His image, and He uses us to keep us in His image and to keep us in bondage and fear and victims of His control. And so it says that the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Jill shared this just a little bit in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5. And he began with his deception. He began with his lies. God is a withholder. He doesn't want to give you uh, all that he has. He's holding something back. God is a controller. He doesn't want you to be free to know and be like what he knows and to be like him. God is a liar. He told you you would die if you ate of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not going to surely die. And we've been into the lie. We took a bite of that lie, and this is what has brought us to the place we are right now. This has taken away from us the freedom, the, the, the freedom that God created us to, ex yeah. to experience the image of God in our very being. And just so we don't make the mistake of blaming our ancient forefathers for their terrible judgment, let's be clear, we have all been biting into the lie ever since. It wasn't just a tree, it wasn't just some fruit, it was a lie, a lie about God, a lie about His character. We believe that God is a controller. We believe that God has, is a liar. We believe that God is withholding something from us. This is the major issue at the heart of all of our pain. It's the major issue at the heart of all of our sorrow, all of our acting out. It's all about our Father and our belief in our Father, our belief in God, our belief in His character, our belief that He is a character of love, that He made us free. The devil is all about bondage. God is all about freedom. And if we could grasp this one reality, we would find freedom, freedom in Christ, freedom to love, freedom to live, freedom to forgive, freedom to move on, freedom, whatever and wherever, from whatever and whatever, wherever, from wherever we've come from and from whatever we've done, freedom to get past all of it, to be restored into God's image. If we would believe this, then we, be, we would become servants of Christ and live and die that others may be set free, mm -hmm. restored to the image of God. So we have part participated in, in Lucifer's rebellion and Christ has come to set us free from that participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Wednesday's lesson called Love Finds a Way. We started this week's lesson with the character of God. God is love. And then God out of his love permits deception and war in heaven, then permits sin on earth. And now we go straight to the heart of the gospel. Love finds a way. Sin is a problem 
for God. Now, it's a problem for us too, but sin is a problem for us in a different way. Picture a child who climbs into dad's car and shifts it into neutral, and it rolls down the driveway into the street and hits, collides with another vehicle, an accident. The child now can't fix it. He knows it's a problem. The child apologizes and the child is sad, but the kid's got no money. He's got no experience repairing vehicles, can't make the phone calls, can't understand the problem even, couldn't arrange towing, doesn't even have the connections to make the phone calls or, or talk to the other driver. Whose problem is it? It's dad's problem. The solution, if there's going to be one, is going to have to come from dad's initiative, from dad's resources, from dad's wisdom, and if there's a price to be paid, it has to be paid from dad's account. Now, sin is nothing at all like crashing a car, but once done, Adam could do nothing. Eve could do nothing to fix it. They could apologize, they could pay a penalty, they could be regretful, they could shift the blame, but they could not unbreak the law. No amount of payment from Adam or any other sinner in all history to follow could ever reverse what had been broken, and no earthly metaphor like the one I've just given is sufficient. Sin broke their essential connection with God and it contaminated them. And you cannot clean a dirty dish with a dirty rag. Adam and Eve, every sinner is a dirty dish and there's nothing in them that is not already contaminated. Sin is not a problem for Adam to puzzle through. It is God's problem. What is God going to do? What can God do? From the moment sin uh, separated God and man, all attention was turned on the Father. What will he do? Can anything be done? Well, there's good news in the title here. Love finds a way to do what sinful man couldn't even hope to hope for. Or more, more accurately, love had already found a way. Love was the way, love had always been the way, and it was embedded in the very nature and character of who God is, love. And we see this, no sooner does Adam sin than God begins to reveal something that he had already established that was personally costly for him. And so there's hope in us for this. We see the illustration of Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. So here's what God's actually said. Genesis 3, verse 15. Go there in your Bibles and we'll stay there for a little bit. So God speaks this to the deceiver, to the serpent, in the presence of the human sinners to be understood and heard by both. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is a promise here. And between your seed and her seed, capital S there, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Adam and Eve could not have begun to grasp these words before they had sinned. But now, here they are facing the consequences of sin, and they can begin to experience the love of God that is expressed in these words. Mercy, forgiveness, sacrifice, and much more. Now, to our feeble human minds clouded by sin and the weight of all, all the things that distract us, these words sound really mysterious. And that's what this is. This is the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the gospel. And the full picture is going to be threaded now through the scriptures, encoded like war messages, bearing instructions of utmost importance, starting right here, revealed step by step. And this is that first step, revealed as we are able to understand it and to bear it. Now, we think of a mystery kind of like uh, the concocted intricacies of hidden sin on a TV program, a murder mystery. No, but um, biblically, a mystery is what God knows and God reveals to us in his time and as we are able to understand it. So Genesis 3.15, that text there, is the beginning of this revelation. And it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy of the cross on which Jesus died. The first prophecy of many. And so in simple words, Genesis 3.15 is the record of the great controversy compressed into just 
a single verse, a sentence, all given in advance. Now, we don't know necessarily how much of it Adam understood right then, but he certainly meditated upon it as we should, and it gave him assurance that God had a plan. Love had already found a way. So if you've never really pondered this text before, let's do it just for a few minutes here and see what we can learn from these words. I will put enmity. Enmity is hatred. Enmity between you and the, the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now, our human heart naturally, because of sinfulness, our carnal nature now, we gravitate towards sin. We love it. The human heart is desperately wicked. We would crawl over land and sea towards sin. And God says, I'm going to give you something that you don't naturally have. I'm going to place an enmity against, uh, against the serpent, the devil. So instead of being destroyed immediately now, Satan is allowed to continue to demonstrate his principles. Enmity exists. He doesn't just wipe him out, but he says, I'm going to allow there to be a conflict and a war so that you can see the demonstrated principles of the serpent and see him for who he truly is. Okay. And that war, we learn this in this verse, is not going to go on forever. It's going to be interrupted and it's going to end. God promises that. And it's going to end because there's going to be the introduction of the seed, capital S and singular, not talking about the seeds, all the genetic descendants of Adam and Eve. This is one person and it's the seed of the woman. Now, all of us came about because of a woman and a man, but this seed comes about without human means, without human involvement. The seed of the woman is God, not human means involved here. God himself becomes in human flesh, puts himself into human flesh. Now it's through the woman, which means he becomes one of us. And this here is God's solution, that the divine son of God would humble himself through self-denial, become one of us and demonstrate for us the way that we must go, self-denial and humbling himself, humility. And by this act, God would make a complete display of his nature, his love in contrast with the violence and the sin of sin and Satan. Okay. Now there's a bruise that's going to happen, or rather two bruises, which lets us know that there's going to be a real conflict and, and, and that the, the seed of the woman, that Christ himself, that God himself is not going to come away from this conflict unscathed. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a price that is paid that he, and this is Jesus, would live a perfect life without sin, not even yielding once to temptation from the devil, from the tempter, even though he is going to be tempted hellishly, torturously, but he's going to live a life of perfect kindness and courtesy, the outpouring of sacrificial love, complete and unblemished. And the contrast is going to be clearly seen, especially at the cross. Perfect self-denial and sacrifice in the face of Satan, who is going to kill, do his best to be willing to kill the Son of God, who is perfect and sinless. Mm -hmm. And all of this happens not by force, but by the display of God's character. And this is going to then deal the death blow to the tempter. He is going to be fully and completely victorious. That's the seed of the woman, not the devil. And there will be a final defeat, the bruising of the head, putting the universe on secure footing, not just for a little while, not just as long as it should last, but forever. In human flesh, God who is sinless could suffer and die in our place, being, bearing the full separation of sin, but because he had no sin, in him, death could have no authority over him. Yeah. Right. And so his heel would be bruised. He would have the marks of, of becoming a human and he would have the pain of the loss of some who he loved for all times. But he would crush and, and destroy the head of the serpent. Listen to 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of of the devil. And we see this in Revelation 20, 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. All this was bound up in those brief words in Genesis 3, 15. And we hear it echoed then in book of John chapter three, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and you know this word verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey, Amen. Wow. Thank you. Set as a, as a father would. Mm -hmm. Wonderful illustration. Thank you so much, Daniel.
and mine is our high priest. This is Thursday's lesson. You know, what sin did to Jesus is nothing compared to what Jesus did to sin. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at that and rejoice today because sin had a powerful nature that man so wonderfully said in the illustration of the car could never resolve. But what Jesus did to sin is what Jesus did to sin is more important than what sin did to Jesus. Not only that, what Jesus did on the cross enables us to have him as our intercessor. You see, our resurrected Lord is our high priest, not just our bruised Lord. The marks of the controversy are still there, but he is fully qualified to be our high priest, providing everything we need to be saved, redeemed, and prepared to live in his kingdom eternally. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest which cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands where you struggle. He knows your day-to-day -day difficulty. He understands your Achilles heel because of his bruised heel. But, we was, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The three words that redeem, the three words that qualifies him as a, as a sufficient redeemer, yet without sin. Then the Bible says in verse 16 of Hebrews 4, with this knowledge, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have you ever lost your keys before? Mm -hmm. And you look for that flashlight that you thought it was in a particular location, but now that you need it, you can't find it. Not so with God's grace. Whenever you're in a difficult situation, God's grace is right at the tip of your finger, right at the end of your prayer, right on the bottom of your knees. Wherever you are in whatever circumstance you're in, God's grace is within one breath away. We can come and obtain mercy and find grace to help even when we can't find our flashlight. You see, but to appreciate our high priest, it's imperative to understand his role. The high priest was the intercessor between God and his people, acting as their representative before God. The role of the high priest, though, was in force as long as the high priest lived. And I asked myself the question, how many high priests did every Israel have? How long did they live? But not so with Jesus. Hebrews 7, verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. And don't miss this part. Since he ever lives to make intercession for us. Isn't that an amen? Mm -hmm. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't take vacations. His full-time job is to save and to intercede for his children. You know, friends, we have a high priest that is not one who has a limited time span on this earth, not so with our high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews 8 and verse 1, now I like this, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest. I like the way this says, not just a high priest, but such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Day and night, night and day, weekends, vacations, holidays, all seasons, all times of day, we have a high priest seated by the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And that priest, what does he do? He offers sacrifices already and he intercedes so that the gift that he provides is now efficacious to reconcile his children back to the father. You see, we're in a difficult situation and a lot of people say, well, I've accepted Jesus, but what do I do if I still fall? Well, there's good news in the high priest's vault. First John two, verse one, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And I like this next. Now it says, and, but I put the word, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What's he doing right now? He's standing up for the rights that he has made available to his children. That's why Revelation 22 verse 14 is so significant. Blessed are those who keep his commandments that they, they may have right to the tree of life. The rights are not in us, the rights are in him. You see, the Lord has made his rights available to us. So when the father sees us, the father sees him. And there is no right that the son does not have in the presence of the father. So what about this right? The Lord looking at the frailty of humanity, as Ryan so 
wonderfully put, and each one of you brought this out, looking at the frailty of his redeemed children says, you know, they still have one disadvantage, this sinful human flesh, mm -hmm. and they are bound to fall somehow, somewhere. Mm -hmm. As the Bible says, the righteous man falls seven times. The, 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 the journey is not done. I've been bruised. I'm perfect, but they're not yet. And so what does he do? He's still in the midst of our frailty, gives us something called freedom of choice. Look at Foreknowledge and Foreordained, this book by Ellen White. She puts this so beautifully on page two, paragraph three. She says this, freedom to do right implies freedom to do wrong. If a man were made so that he could not do wrong, he could have no freedom at all, not even to do right. He would be less than the brutes. There is no virtue in forced obedience, nor would there be any virtue in doing that which is right if there were no possibility of doing that which is wrong. So the Lord sees us struggling. I want to do right. But as Paul says, what I want to do, I can't do. And what I hate to do, that's what I keep on doing. So how do I find hope? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What does an advocate do? An advocate advocates, stands between. He says, Father, I'm not done yet. The work I began in them, I'm going to complete it. So keep John in our book of life. Keep Jill and Ryan and James and, and, and Daniel in the book of life. I'm not done with them yet. And they don't even know it. It has not yet been revealed to them what they shall be. But Father, my blueprints shows me what they're going to look like when I'm done. The blueprint is the character of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. So our high priest is working out his salvation according to his perfect blueprints, his own righteousness. But he's not done yet because in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives, there are frailties, there that battle on a day-by-day -day basis. So when we think about the high priest, Mark Finley asked the question, how does that thought give us assurance in a world of temptation, suffering, disease, and death? I have four points, Jill, and here they are. What about the high priest? Let's first understand his identity. Jesus understands our struggles. He empathizes with our frailty. We don't have to feel diffident to approach God's throne. We don't need to be shy or feel this lack of assurance to come through his throne. Why? Because insecurity vanishes in the presence of Jesus. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. When you give your life to Christ, even in the moments that you fail miserably, he says, I can do more for you than you can ever imagine can be done for yourself. Just come to him, call on him. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. First from identity to invitation. We are invited to come to Jesus with confidence, not to demand his grace, but to receive the grace that is freely extended to us. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I might give you rest. I will. Say it again. I will. I will give you rest. This is an assurance. Come with confidence. Father, I need your help. Come, I'll give you rest. Rest from your frailties. Rest from your disappointments. Rest from the plans that just didn't work out, the marriage that fell apart, the children that went astray, the job that fell through, the plans you had that just looked like it was going to succeed, but something happened. Come to me and I will give you rest. Not only that, the influence. You see, there is no depth to which we can sink that God cannot reach. Jesus reaches to our extremity to redeem us and prepare us for his eternity. So there's no place that God can't reach us. David said it, Psalm 139, verse 8. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. No matter how high your frailty and how low you're faltering, the Lord can reach you at both extremes. I am always and in every case where you are present. And finally, from identity, invitation, influence to intercession. The throne of grace is reserved for the hopeless and the helpless because Jesus delights in saving us. Lamentation 5 verse 19. How do we find salvation in lamentation? Here it is. You, O oh Lord, remain forever, your throne from generation to generation. Whenever the emergency, you can come boldly before the throne of grace because it's never moved. God is always there. And why is he there? Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for us. So here it is in a nutshell. 
Everything that we should be, he is. In Christ, there's no, con no condemnation for our sins that are past. In Christ, our guilt is gone, and through his mighty intercession, we can be saved. In Christ, the power of sin in us is broken, and the chains that bind us are loosed, and we are free because God is love. Mm, wow, powerful lesson. Great start to a great new lesson this quarter. Let's go ahead and take some time for some final thoughts. Amen. This has been a powerful lesson. I'm blessed already. God is love. You don't have to listen to Satan's deceptions. You can make a choice to follow Jesus. Amen. And planet Earth became involved. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Satan has misrepresented God, but Jesus Christ came to reveal who he truly is, a God of love. Mm -hmm. I want to take you to the book, The Great Controversy, page 6 to 51, paragraph 2, the last two sentences. They say this, the cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. That's right. And what kind of high priest do we have? I love the book of Romans, Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, our high priest, our advocate, our savior, our Lord died for us. That's the high priest that we all need to have today. Mm. Amen. I just want to read just a small paragraph from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 39. Speaking of the rebellion in heaven, it says, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw that the Lord and his righteousness, saw the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in his works, that the divine statutes are just and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. He nearly reached a decision to return, but pride forbade him. My friends, don't let pride keep you from coming to Christ. Why should you die for your sins when he has already died for them? Put your trust in Jesus today. We want you to be encouraged to join us next week for lesson number two in our study on the great controversy. And lesson number two is entitled, The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness. So don't go away. Come back next week and join us for the special study on 3BN Sabbath School Panel.